New England Fights featherweight champion Josh Harvey is still undefeated and one of the top pound-for-pound -pound fighters in all of New England. His next fight against Ricky Dexter will be one of the toughest fights of his career so far. NEF 40 is right around the corner, September the 7th in Orono. And we caught up with Josh and head coach Primo Bellarosa at the Bangor Sea Dog to look forward to this monster fight. So, Josh, this is obviously one of the most highly anticipated fights uh, in Bangor in quite some time. Tell us Absolutely. a little bit about how this fight was made. Well, um, I heard about Ricky's side of what transpired as far as how the fight came up. Uh, I didn't just walk up and say, uh, hey, let's fight September. Uh, my recollection, not to call someone a liar, uh, was that him and Carl were talking about you know, fighting their upcoming fights, and Ricky saying how he was hard pressed to get a fight in his last couple fights backed out. And I said, Well, I kind of interrupted and said, Well, if you don't get matched and I don't get matched in September, I'll fight you. And then there's a kind of a not so awkward silence, we little silence. He goes, hey, Well, wait. And I said, 55, just like the last time. And, and, and then the next thing I hear was from. <clears throat> Chris Young, who said, uh, you know, he texted me a couple days later and goes, what's your side of the story? And I said, well, uh-oh, if there's a side of the story, then some of the talk has already gone from, from that conversation and further. And I said, well, if, if you're getting other sides of the story, then um, I guess you already know. And then we got a message from Peterson. I think he messaged Coach first. Yeah, he messaged, messaged me and said, uh, what do you think about this fight? And... Uh, I mean, my, my own, uh, Chris Young and I, uh, Ricky's coach, are, are good friends. And uh, so my only question was, you know, did Chris and, and Ricky accept the fight? Or would they accept it? And he said they already did. And I said, all right, great, we got a fight. Now, obviously, this hasn't been, uh, it hasn't been very long since you and Chris Young parted ways and you're no longer training at Young's MMA. Is, is this awkward to have your first fight since leaving the gym you've been at your whole career? now fighting someone that's training uh, under Chris Young and then Young's? I mean, it's not awkward for me. Um, I guess maybe there are some people who are friends with Ricky uh, and friends with me who might uh, not know what, what side of the cage to sit on. But no, uh, like I said that night when, uh, when I told Ricky that, hey, I'll fight you in September, I'll fight my brother. I'll, you know, and me and my brother used to actually used to get down just to get down. It doesn't mean anything to me. It's a fight. It's what we do. We're professionals. Now, Primo, uh, you've been in Josh's uh, corner for quite some time now. Yeah. Just take us back to the beginning and tell us uh, how you first started uh, training with Josh and coaching him and, and the evolution of him <coughs> since you've been with him. Well, I, uh, I got married five years ago, actually, August 2nd. And uh, so my wife and I own a camp uh, in Maine. And we were up for our honeymoon. And we were staying for the whole month. And uh, about two weeks in... I was getting antsy. I hadn't done any Muay Thai in a while. And I said to my wife, hey, you know, would you mind if I kind of made some calls around to see if maybe I could do a seminar somewhere? And she said, yeah, of course. And uh, I ended up doing a seminar at, uh, at Young's MMA. And great group of guys over there. I ended up doing a seminar. And uh, after I did the seminar, I, I think I might have come back the next day and worked with a couple of the fighters a little bit. And Josh was there. And Josh came over to my wife and I and had said, you know, I really appreciated, you know, what you did and the knowledge you brought. And it kind of took me out of my element a little bit. Uh, I own a farm and I give horse riding lessons. And I kind of like to take you guys out of your element a little bit. And I'd like to offer you guys a free horse riding lesson. And so, I don't know if it, it within the week, yeah. uh, we ended up, my wife and I, going out to Harvey's farm. And, uh, you it know. looks good on a horse. I do. I look like the Marlboro <laughs> Man. It's a fact. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we went out and, uh, you know, I'd never ridden a horse before in my life. And, you know, he took us out on like, probably, I don't know, like a two hour horse ride. It felt like two hours uh -huh. and, uh, we had a great time and we just kind of hit it off from there. And, uh, I had said to my wife, I was like, you know, I, I really think this is a good dude. I think I could help him. And so I just, I extended, uh, you know, an open invitation to Josh. Anytime you're in New York or anytime you want to come to New York, 
you're welcome to come to my gym and work out. And then obviously every time I was up in Maine, him and I would get together. Right. And uh, I mean, at this point, you know, Josh is my fighter, I'm his coach, but we're friends. Mm -hmm. And so even if, even if we're not getting together to work out, we're still friends. We're going to get together and, and hang out, you know? So it just kind of, it kind of went from there. Um, I think I, I was in your corner for your, for your, am, for your, for your amateur title fight, I believe. Title defense. Title perhaps. defense, I believe. Yep. Yeah. And then, so I was there with him for the end of his amateur career and I've been there for every fight in his pro career. So from the beginning, since you first met and you first started working together, how frequently do you think you guys got together to train? Jeez. Uh, I made a monthly habit of yeah. making a trip to New York. So that compiled with how many times you went up yeah. we were up here. Yeah, and when he would, camp. you know, when Josh would come down to New York, he would stay for at least a week, sometimes two weeks. Uh, <clears throat> on any given training camp, especially, he would get out to New York and sometimes twice mm -hmm. be able to get down. And then obviously when I, whenever I was up into Maine, we made it a point uh, as long as I was here to be getting sessions in with each other. So, and so quite a bit. For anybody that, that doesn't know your history in combat sports, just tell us a little bit about what you've accomplished and what you specialize in. Uh, okay, uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a Muay Thai, I was a Muay Thai fighter. I had, I had some MMA fights, I was 3-0 and as a pro, uh, but Muay Thai was really where I excelled. Uh, I was 14-1 and as a professional in, in Muay Thai. I was 25-1 and as an amateur in Muay Thai. I managed to, uh, I, was, I was on the USA team uh, so I, I represented the country at the world championships. Um, I have seven titles, uh, not one pair of pants to go with any of those belts. <laughs> um, so uh, I, you know, I had a, I you know, fought in a few different countries. Um, I've had a, a fairly extensive fight career, uh, and my my coaching career has gone on from there. So, so when you take a look at Josh, obviously he's a very skilled uh, mixed martial artist. What what is the easiest uh, part about coaching him, and what's the most difficult part to coach him? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, the, uh. the the easiest part about uh, coaching Josh is he has an excellent work ethic, and he has a real desire to get it right. Um, he's obviously obviously to be a good athlete, you have to be coordinated. So <clears throat> kind of goes without saying, even though I just said it. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, he has a real desire to not just hit hard, but to hit correctly and hit hard. And that's that's kind of a joy as a coach to be able to train somebody that really wants to get it right and wants to wants to look good while they're doing it. You know, because um, I'd like to consider myself a, a technician and a, and a technical coach, and that's nice to work with somebody like that. Uh, one of the worst things about Josh is he's he's pig headed, um, but you got to be pig headed to be a, to be a fighter. I know because I was a fighter and. Especially when I was fighting, I was pig-headed. Uh, and, I, I mean, I'd rather a pig-headed fighter than a fighter that just kind of mm -hmm. rolls over, you know, because I can't, I can't teach that. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you're a roll-over type of guy, that's a real hard thing to train out of you, you know, so. So, so what are some of the techniques that you have used to kind of get through to Josh when he's, ha when he's having a tough time uh, maybe doing what you're wanting him to do in training? What, what have you learned uh, to do to adapt to, uh, to him uh, specifically as a fighter? I mean, uh, Josh and I have a, have a really good uh, training relationship, I think. Um, a little bit of carrot, a little bit of stick. Yeah, a little bit of carrot, a little bit of <laughs> stick. Sometimes I swipe the carrot back and hit him with a stick. Um, I'm a, yeah, I mean, it sounds horrible. I'm a, I'm a negative reinforcement type of coach like I'm I'm going to tell you all the things you do wrong and you've got to have a bit of a thick skin mm -hmm. to be able to take that now I think it means all the more when I tell you, you did something good oh it does you know what yeah, I mean absolutely. um and I've I've gotten on Josh about not doing something right or I need you to do this or why are you doing it like that and you know after riding him for an entire practice I'll go over to him afterwards and be like hey man I want you to know I'm only doing this because I care about you. And his immediate reaction is, coach, I know. I'm, I'm not here for you to tell me how great I am. You know, so I think it just, it works out for us in the room. And we, we both come, we have a wrestling background. Yeah. So we've been yep. in that wrestling room where, you know, nobody, nobody's going, you know, you're great. Yeah. You know, good job. Mm -hmm. So. so it seems like you and your, your coach Primo have a really solid relationship and it's been that way for a while now. It, has this yeah. relationship and, and this coaching fighter, uh, you know, the, the relationship that you guys have, has this just seemed like a natural progression? Like did, did it 
seem to you like maybe back in the day when you were at Young's that eventually you were going to make this transition over to Primo full time? No, uh, you know, I would uh, always dance with the girl I came with, you know, not to steal your words, Absolutely. but that's, you know, Chris would have um, been along my side all the way as far as I take this game. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I was approached about maybe me not um, fitting in, we'll leave it that way. Like maybe, that I, maybe I didn't fit in mm -hmm. uh, with, with what the routine was and what they're doing there, so. And, and I know there's been a lot of changes at Young's. Obviously, you're not there anymore. Bruce Boynton's gone. Right. Ryan Sanders, I'm not sure what he's doing nowadays. Aaron right. is injured. A lot of the staples that have been there for a very long time aren't there training, which, you know, I talked to Ricky a little about, a bit about it when I interviewed him, and, and he said it's no big deal. He still has plenty of guys that are there getting them ready for the fight, and that may be true, but when you have those killers that are in there on a daily basis, you know, iron sharpens iron, it just gets you that much more prepared. Do you just feel like, um, you know, are, are you happier now with where you're at? Or Ooh, that's is, loaded. Or is it, is it <laughs> I mean, because I'm sure it's, this is, is a little awkward for you, right? I mean, no, there's no awkwardness here. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm happier. I'm, you know, but if you can show up to work, and this, you know, this is my job. I'm a professional with a smile, and it's not like I got to go into practice today. I'm, I'm happy to get into practice. It's really difficult to get into you know, a room where I'm, you know, I, I want to train for the guy, not the fight you have, but the fight you want. And you get into a room where guys are kind of just, they're, they're training like they had to come to the gym today. Are you more motivated for this fight than you've ever been? I'm motivated for every fight, but, um, you know, there's no, there's no bad blood, per se, but, you know, people are in question of, like, who's the toughest guy in Letterkenny. <coughs> it's right here, man. Let's talk about that first fight. You guys fought a couple years back as amateurs. It was for the lightweight four title. Years. Four, four years. Four years. Has it been four years? It's been four years. Oh, my God. Time flies. Yeah. That was a very highly anticipated fight as well. Mm -hmm. And you caught him early on and submitted him. Um, Ricky had mentioned before he made no excuses about it, but yep. he did say that he had a staff infection uh, going at, leading into that fight. Well, there's a butt there, right? There's a butt. So, and and yeah. you know what butt means? Disregard everything that I said before the words butt. Okay. I, I don't want to make an excuse. But here are my excuses. Or now that I've given you my disclaimer, I'm going to tell you how I really feel. Mm -hmm. If you if you decide to take a fight and don't say anything about any problems you have going into that, you lose the right to say anything about it afterwards. So, do you feel like there's any reason that this second fight is going to turn out any differently than the first fight, or do you fully expect to go in and uh, finish him in the, within the first round? I mean, I'm not going to call a first round finish. Uh, the outcome's going to be the same. My hand's going to be raised, and uh, I'll still be the toughest guy in Letterkenny. Rick, Ricky's a really tough dude, and he will show up to fight, mm -hmm. and he will still lose. Where do you feel Ricky's biggest weaknesses are? Where can Josh exploit him the most? I think Josh is better than him in all aspects of the game. Uh, if they if they want to stay standing, Josh will win it standing. If they want to go to the ground, Josh will win it on the ground, whether it's ground and pound or, or a submission. Uh, but I, I think that, <coughs> excuse me, I think that Josh is better in all aspects of the of the game than, than Ricky is, and that's not that's not a slight at Ricky. Like I said, uh, my interaction with Ricky has always been he's he's a pretty cool dude, mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean that I think he's going to win. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to say who mentioned this to me. A, a, a couple different individuals, uh, when I've talked to them about this Ricky Dexter, Josh Harvey main event for NEF 40, said that the way that they feel this fight could go is if Josh catches him in the first round, that's Josh's best chance of winning. If it gets out of the first round, they feel like Ricky's cardio uh, could carry him sure. to maybe win a decision. Listen, uh, you know, do, the, like do, do, do the math. Uh, Josh is, on a, is undefeated. He's got six wins all in the first round. If I was coaching against Josh, I would tell my guy, take him into deep water. Mm -hmm. You gotta get him into the third round. If it's a five round fight, you gotta get him into four and five. That's how you beat this kid. Mm -hmm. Feel free to try it. Feel free to come in in as good a shape as possible. Because if you think that Josh isn't training for a long fight, you're crazy. He's just managed to stop all his fights We're early. gonna win every second of every round, however many rounds there are. Yeah. One of the questions that, that I wanted to ask the both of you here today is, you know, 
first and foremost, I just want to say I have nothing but the utmost respect for you as a fighter. I saw what you did against Joe Gennetti. Anybody that doesn't know who Joe Gennetti is, just turn on the Ultimate Fighter and right. watch what he did. He made it all the way to the finale. Uh, and Josh went three the, rounds with him. That's right. And, and won and that fight, by the way. Remember that. Yes, he he yeah. won that uh, fight. A lot, of, a lot of people Thanks. do feel exactly that way, that very strongly that you won that fight. A lot of your detractors, the people out there that say that you're not as good as people, some people think you are, say that outside of Gennetti, the competition of your fighters, the fighters that you've gone against, haven't been that, that, uh, that great. What do, you, what do you have to say to that? I say uh, we're managing a career. It's the right fights at the right times, and these are the people who are put in front of me. And you know, whoever else is put in front of me will, is going to end the same way. Yeah, Josh is exactly right. I mean... Anybody that says, aside from Gianetti, have those guys fought Gianetti? You know what I mean? Uh, on top of that, as a professional, you fight who's put in front of you. Doesn't matter what the record is, doesn't matter who they are. If I put the devil in the red corner and say that's who we're fighting, that's who we go and fight. And so the matches that have been offered to him, he's gone and fought, and he's won those fights. Now, this is going to be Ricky's second fight as a pro. Uh, he was very accomplished as an amateur, but he did have two losses to you and C.J. Ewer. Mm -hmm. When you look at Ricky overall as a mixed martial artist, just break him down. Like, if you were a coach and you were getting ready to uh, prep your fighter to go in against Ricky Dexter, what are the things that stand out to you that, that he does well and that he's maybe not so good at? I mean, I think uh, if I'm in Ricky's corner, which, you know, I've been his advocate before, uh, this fight is, you know, he has, he has raw power, you know, he lifts, you know, he's, he's in the gym lifting, he's, he probably is banking on being the bigger dude, which I'm not sure that in this case, I know I'm taller, I think at this point I'm probably bigger. Um, I don't know, I'm going to take a speed and skill over, over size and power any day, so... I, I, I think really I think Ricky's banking on you know th there's that old saying uh, all things being equal the bigger man wins mm. and I think at 160 pounds Ricky's kind of kind of banking on all things being equal the bigger man wins and he wants to be the bigger man uh, but he's making a mistake in thinking that all things are equal. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about weight. Uh, what are you weighing in at right now? And moving forward, I know you struggled with your last couple of, of weight cuts. I, I hope that that's uh, all better now. I know you had a little scare. Sore spot. Yeah. Sore spot, yeah. <laughs> well, are we going to see you fight at featherweight moving forward, or is lightweight going to be your new home? Um, I am a featherweight. I, I would take only specific fights at lightweight. Um, you know, this is one of those fights that I'm okay at lightweight. Um, I think after missing weight and, and having – a little bit of a scare myself, uh, a lightweight, or I was I was looking for more of a catchweight at 150, but uh, you know Ricky wanted to do 160, which I don't think five pounds affects the outcome of this fight. So explain that for anybody that doesn't know, uh, your last fight uh, was canceled because you had a trouble making weight. Just tell us a little bit about what happened. Yeah, well I was on on point for where I've always caught from, which is a little extreme for what most people here you know you're what 12 15 pounds two days out and I yeah that's that's what I like to cut from I like to wake up and be eight eight or ten that morning and cut hard um, I was about a pound pound four out with 40 minutes to an hour to go for the weigh-in and then I just started getting fuzzy and uh, you know I was I was found in the sauna like just kind of out so who found you um, Sujin Okay. Lee, yeah. mm -hmm. And so Primo, as his coach moving forward, uh, what are some of the things that, that you want to see Josh do to, to make sure that he's making that cut safely uh, and he hits 145 yeah, and, uh, the correct way? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I, I, th I, I think that will change in the future uh, because I'm here full time now. So I will monitor Josh's weight cut more closely. Is this a diet thing? Is it, is it food? I think it's, it's a combination of things. Um, I think that it's... Uh, <laughs> Allowing yourself to be a little too big in between fights, uh, not maintaining uh, an optimum weight mm -hmm. in between fights. And a lot of fighters have that issue. They peak and valley, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is leaving a little bit too much to the end. And a lot of fighters do that as well, where they, where they say, well, you know, the weight cut's going to be horrible anyways. So what's the difference between 12 and 15? Yeah. Well, there is a big difference between yeah. 12 and 15, right? So... I think going, going. I mean, I'll tell you this. Josh Harvey will not miss 145 again because if he misses 145 again, we're done fighting at 45. 
or I'm done coaching him at 45 because I'm not going to put him in a position where he's going to hurt himself. Mm-hmm. Wow. That the, That's the most important thing. As a coach, I will not put a fighter in a position where they could hurt themselves. Mm-hmm. It's a dangerous game to begin with. We don't need to make it any more dangerous. So if, if we have another situation like he did last time where he ends up having to go to the ER, we're mm-hmm. done fighting at 45, or I'm done being a part of the team. You know what I mean? And that's only because I care about it. Okay? So he won't miss 45 again. <clears throat> but that being said, it's about weight management mm-hmm. and doing the right things. And I think we're on that course right now. Yeah. You know? So what's the heaviest you get in between camps? With him right here. You know I mean? Yeah, with me right here. <laughs> sure. Uh, 80 ish. Let's leave it at that. Like that. 89 ish? No, no. Um, so the biggest point I've been in my life, I'm not going to say when it was. I was a 202 at, at one point in my life. So okay. I'm, I'm a f- true featherweight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Primo, let's talk a little bit about uh, Josh's ceiling. Before we went live, uh, you mentioned to me that you've actually been approached uh, to fight for Contender Series mm-hmm. on a couple of occasions, but you just didn't feel it was the right time. We've had offers for Bellator as well. Okay, so moving forward, uh, what can we expect to see Josh uh, doing? Where where can we see him fight? Is it going to be Bellator? When, when will Josh will make it to the UFC. He, um, if Josh doesn't make it to the UFC, it's because he's decided not to. That's that's really where it's at. Uh, he And I've seen, I've coached guys in the UFC, I've coached guys in Bellator, I've coached guys in Glory, I, I know what the horse flesh is, and Josh has the talent, and he has the physicality, and he has the work ethic. Mm-hmm. He can do all those things. Uh, I won't repeat any of this at tomorrow's I'm never training. Say that. All right, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so he he has that, and as and as a coach, you have guys that you train, and you just have to be honest. You have this guy that you train, and you go. He's a pretty decent fighter, but he's never going to make it to a big show. And that just is what it is. Not everybody's going to play in the NBA, right? But they can still enjoy the game. Uh, then you have other guys where you can say, he'll make it into a big show, and he's going to fight out his first four-fight contract, and he's going to get cut because he'll, he's going to go two and two. Mm-hmm. Or he might go one and three. Mm-hmm. But he's good enough to get to that show. And you have guys that are, I don't know, the Keith Jardines, of the world, right? Guys that can get into a big show and they're going to be a gatekeeper. Gotcha. You've got to go through that guy to get to a championship. And you can tell if you've got that guy. And then there's guys that can be champions. Uh, <clears throat> I think we've got a long ways to go with Josh, but he is definitely that elite level caliber. Uh, so you think maybe one day down the line we could see him, uh, God willing, competing against like a Max Holloway? Absolutely. For, well, Absolutely. A lot. And I don't say that. I don't, I don't blow smoke. Uh, Josh has been with me for a while, and I've had I've had very few fighters that I say stuff like that about. Because um, there's there's a lot of things that happen between now and getting there. You know what I mean? Um, but Josh can absolutely do that. And I mean, we've we've had some of those offers. We've had offers for the Contender Series. We've had offers for Bellator, and we turned them down because, like Josh said earlier, it's it's the right fights at the right time. And uh, you know, like I said, we we've had offers for say Bellator. And I look at the opponent and I go, wow, that's, that's a tough fight. That's somebody I think that you can beat, mm-hmm. but you don't have to beat him right now. And you certainly don't have to beat him right now for the kind of money they're going to mm-hmm. pay you. Let's, let's get to the point where they, where they have to bring you in. And then they have to give you the right matches and they have to pay you accordingly for that stuff. You know, one thing, Josh, that I'm interested to hear your thoughts about, uh, the only guy that you lost to as an amateur, Dylan Lockhart, is now <coughs> going to be fighting uh, on ESPN Plus for Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender good Series here yes. in a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, good for him. It's, yeah. a, it's a huge opportunity. Um, is that someone uh, that... At some point down the line. The right fight's at the right time, and I think there's going to come a time when that's the right fight. So so you do believe that he's a UFC caliber guy? Like you'll. I think I think he's going to be in there, and, uh, I, you know, I don't see him being champion level I think he already has a couple losses he's six and two mm-hmm. don't quote me on that so but I think he's he's gonna be a staple mm-hmm. so what did you think of his most recent performance uh, against like, Erickson yeah um, you know Jesse's a good guy I, I, I call that going down um, kind of like that so once again I think the, the speed speed is huge in this game mm-hmm. 
Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, September the 7th in Orono. Again, main event, Ricky Dexter. And the D Susan Collins Center That's for the right. Arts. That's being right. being recognized as artists now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mixed martial artists. Poetry in motion. Do you anticipate uh, being the, uh, the baby face or the heel going into this night? <laughs> Want to say that again? Baby face or the yeah. heel? It's, it's a, a wrestling term. Uh, no, 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 that's right. The good guy or the bad guy? The good guy or the bad guy? Oh, I mean, <coughs> I think up until this point, I've always been like the villain. But you know, you know, people who cast the first stone, mm -hmm. you know, I think I could be the hero. Yeah, because yeah, we'll I, I guess the reason I'm asking that is because both you and Ricky are from the area, mm -hmm. right? You're going to have a ton of family, friends, uh, fans all there to support you. Do you think it's going to be split, like right down the middle, like you guys are going to have people cheering for you, uh, you know, 50-50? Or is this just going to be one of those fights where, you know, it just doesn't matter. People are just going to be there to see a good fight. I hope people are there, just there to support local MMA, but, you know, we'll see whose fans boo. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, you know, be good. <laughs> All my people out there, you know, the family can get a little rowdy. So, uh, no, I think it's going to be uh, pretty close so as it, far as half and a half. If, if you're looking at, at this fight for your career down the road, and this is a question for you too, Primo, you know, you have a lot more experience as a professional than Ricky does. So is it is it important for you to not just win, but go in there and win impressively? Yeah, I don't... I, there won't be anything to question uh, after this fight, and I, I really like the idea of not leaving it to the judges again ever in my career because we saw how that works mm -hmm. out. I mean, in, in in six wins, Josh has six finishes. I I've never had to ask Josh to get on it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, and so, you know, that being said, what what I've always said to Josh is, we need to win every minute of every round, and if you do that, knockouts and finishes come. And even if the knockout and the finish doesn't come, you still won every minute of every round and you'll win this fight, you know? Uh, but he's gotten on every guy that he's had to get on, so I'm not worried about it. He's not hard to find in a fight. He'll be the guy that's right in front of you. Is there any chance down the line we're going to see the rematch with Gennetti? We certainly won't see it in his hometown on his show. <laughs> Yeah. Have you talked to Matt Peterson and tried to get the, that matchup here for NEF? Because I mean, that would be a monster uh, headliner of an event. I mean, it's, it's one of those unnecessary fights. It was unnecessary when I went down and fought him on short notice, a weight class up. Uh, you know, at the time, you know, the overlookers in my career thought it was a great idea. So. I was against that fight. Mm -hmm. I'll say it. Yeah. I was against it. Why? Uh, because, again... I didn't think Josh, at that point in his career, had to have a fight of that type. Mm -hmm. um, I also didn't think it was a good idea to go down to that dude's hometown and fight on the promotion that his former teammate is the promoter. Mm -hmm. And people can say whatever they want, and I know for a fact the promoter doesn't pick the judges, but Josh got hometown in that fight, without a doubt in my mind and I, I'm not the type of coach that thinks my guy won everything mm -hmm. in a close fight I'll tell my guy he lost if, if we have a close round my guys come back I tell them they lost that round because I think I owe it to them to play against my, my own biases you know so if if that was a close fight and it had gone to Giannetti or been a draw I would have told him hey man it was a close fight that's the way these go sometimes but that wasn't a close fight Josh won two rounds Hands down, he lost one round. Hands down. So, wouldn't it make more sense now that he's already proven himself to, to be on that level of uh, Joe Gennetti, who makes it to the finale of the Ultimate Fighter? Doesn't it seem almost necessary to have the rematch now to, to prove that that you Let's will? have him make featherweight then. We already went. Fair we enough. went. To, we went to his town and went up in weight. So, come on to our town, come down in weight. Fair enough. And we can go from there. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, prediction time for uh, the Collins Center. Uh, you know, Ricky and yourself, again, one of the biggest fights here regionally in a while. How are you going to get your hand raised, Josh? Uh, whatever it takes. You know, I'm sure he said he sees openings in my game. That's, that's great. Uh, I'll plug the holes as I see them, and uh, in the end, my hand will be raised. Primo? Uh, can I quote Clubber Lang? <laughs> Please hey. do. <laughs> yeah, I just always wanted to say that. Yeah. You know, uh, I, Josh is going to win this fight. Uh, he's going to win the fight whether it's standing or on the ground. Oh and he's going to win it 
either with a knockout or a submission or a decision, but he's going to win this fight. What's next, guys? When do you want to fight next, and will it be for NEF? Are you going to defend that featherweight title? We're not looking past Ricky. We're looking through him. There you go. That's it. Mm -hmm.